Greetings from the University Park campus of Penn State. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and also thank you, Professor Hui Liang Wei. Today, I want to present data models and results to show how everyone can model additive manufacturing, and I mean everyone, to solve scientific, technological, and commercial problems of additive manufacturing to make very good parts. What I have planned for this talk is here. First, I want to share my three reasons why additive manufacturing cannot do without modeling. And then I want to show results that beginner researchers, people with no experience, how they have contributed significantly to the advancement of our understanding of additive manufacturing. And then for people who are interested in computer programming, I will show how they are making major contributions. But most important, we value modeling because it provides us with insight and knowledge that we cannot get any other way. And finally, I will sum up, provide an outlook, and talk about the greater impact of modeling. My first reason why 3D printing cannot do without modeling, why this is so critical to do mathematical modeling. Take, for example, solidification cracking. This is a huge problem, not just for aluminum alloys, but for many other alloys. So what can we do to prevent cracking in additively manufactured materials? Well, we can look up the literature and we will find that there are many variables that control cracking. I have listed them here like laser power, beam radius, scanning speed, and a whole host of other things and thermophysical properties. If you count the total number of variables, you will find at least 12 variables. So if you want to do experiments and experimentally determine the optimum conditions for preventing cracking, you will see that you will need to do 2 to the power 12, which is about 4,096 experiments based on two-factor design of experiments. This will take us more than 10 years to do. So it is impractical to investigate so many variables to optimize experimentally to prevent cracking. So we need a new path. And that new path is modeling because you can very quickly get a lot of information. And we recently published a paper just earlier this year to show how that can be done. And this paper has now become a news item in MRS Bulletin. The recent MRS Bulletin in October has a news item on how this can be done. Second, for a given variable, say power, there is a wide variation of power. There is a wide variation of scanning speed. Most important, there is a wide variation of cooling rate. And such high variation of cooling rate results in very different microstructure and properties of parts. So not only are there are many variables, for each variable, the parameter space is so large that it is difficult to explore the entire parameter space experimentally. One can use models to do so. Finally, I want to talk a little bit about the cost, commercial aspects. I am showing some results from a recent paper uh, it's a little bit dated, 2019, where I assembled a team of university researchers, U.S. national labs, and large corporations. 
and we came up with the most important scientific, technological, and commercial problems that need to be solved. And one of the issues we found in terms of commercial problems is that if you look at the cost percentage in manufacturing and material, the manufacturing costs are significant. The material costs are not inexpensive, but but the manufacturing cost is pretty high for metallic materials. Take, for example, a simple wrench. And this uh, data we got from 3D systems. There is This is the metal material cost. This is the cost of the design. This is the setup. This is printing. And this is post-processing. That means we need support structures. We need to take out the support structure. We need to clean up after we take out the support structure because then the surface becomes rough and we need to make it smooth. So the cost is not insignificant, which means if we do very large number of experiments, it will be too expensive to be practical. So. If we instead do simulations, we can reduce the total number of experiments. And that is my third reason. There are many other reasons, but I would rather not go into those because I have limited time. So I focus on beginner researchers because we need everyone to help us. We need to increase substantially the research efforts in modeling. That means we need people who are now doing experiments to augment their experiments with modeling. And there are some prerequisites. And the prerequisite is, of course, the knowledge of additive manufacturing processes, which means we all have to read more literature. We have to know the solution methodology. And we have to also know what are the simplifying assumptions that we must make to make our simulations tractable. We need to understand a little bit about governing equations, scaling analysis, and I'm going to give some examples to illustrate this. So for now, you can ignore that. And solution methodology. This also, I'm going to give you examples. So I start by giving three examples of where new students beginner researchers can do significant modeling to contribute in a major way in our understanding of additive manufacturing. So a basic question, estimation of the depth of the melt pool based on dimensional analysis. So what we do is we list all the variables, like dimensionless heat input, it's very important. More heat you provide, more would be the depth, dimensionless preheat temperature, thermal diffusivity, and then layer thickness. And then we, we seek to understand how much would be the melt pool depth. So what we do, there are five variables, and there is one dimension, length. So there will be five minus one, or four pi terms. And pi is a non-dimensional term for making dimensional analysis. So pi 1, in this case, is the depth of the melt pool by layer thickness. Pi 2, in this case, is the heat input per unit volume divided by the heat input for melting unit volume. Then pi 3, in this case, is preheat temperature by ambient temperature. And pi 4 is thermal diffusivity at high temperature divided by the uh, thermal diffusivity at room temperature. If we do a dimensional analysis, we develop a model. Like here, delta by t is our objective function, where delta is the depth of penetration of the fusion zone. That can be expressed in terms of all these parameters. And if we take data from the literature for these five variables here, 
Thai 6.4, Inconel 718, 625, stainless steel, aluminum, silicon, tin, magnesium. You can see that delta by T becomes a linear function, almost a linear function of these parameters, non-dimensional parameters that are all listed here. So this then becomes our model. So if we now provide all these variables, we can determine what would be the depth of penetration. And this can be done by beginner researchers. This was done by a beginner researcher and it's publishable in mainstream journals like Additive Manufacturing. We published a paper in 2022. I want to show you how a beginner researcher can estimate peak residual stress. This is very important. You don't need so much the details of the residual stress as you need to be careful about the maximum residual stress. That you can do by dimensional analysis. Again, we follow the same techniques. We, have, we list all the variables. We figure out how many variables are there, how many dimensions are there. We subtract the two. Those will be the total number of non-dimensional variables as I have written here, pi 1 as a function of pi 2, pi 3, pi 4, pi 5, and pi 6. And we develop a model and then we collect data from the literature. And here we have done so for the additive manufacturing of five different alloys. And then we plot them to see how good our model fit is. And this, again, we published this year in Additive Manufacturing Journal. And, uh, and the, the student was a new student. So beginner researchers can develop important models that can provide significant insight about additive manufacturing, and we need more people to do modeling. Let's estimate lack of fusion defects. This is another very important topic, and I think beginner researchers can make significant contributions here as well, and here is an example. List all the variables, figure out how many pi terms, develop a model just like the last two examples I gave and plot the data and see whether it conforms to your model. So this is a validation of the model. If we wanted to do this by experiments, you could do it and we, we do experiments. That is how we validate the model. But if you did not augment your research program with modeling, if you did depend on only the experiments, then it would be a long road. And that is why we need to use uh, modeling together with uh, valuable experiments to make progress in solving the scientific, technological, and commercial problems that are faced by additive manufacturing community. So what type of physics-based models we can use? You know, many of the inquiries we do require temperature field. So we can solve heat conduction equations. We can get thermal cycles that affect microstructure and properties. I'm going to talk more about that later on. But let me also mention that we can very confidently now predict the fusion zone geometry based on such kind of modeling. And they, again, we published that last year. So beginner researchers can make significant contributions in additive manufacturing. So what about people that have some interest in computer programming? We welcome them very much because um, you know, there are many off-the-shelf models that are available today. I'm going to give you some examples. 
And again, there are some prerequisites. We have to know, we have to have knowledge of what we are solving, how we are solving uh, initial conditions, boundary conditions. And in some cases, we need to develop also auxiliary models together with temperature field so that we can uh, explore more. So allow me to give two examples. We want to know the details of distortion and residual stress. So we want to solve thermomechanical variables. And many people use off-the-shelf programs like Abacus and ANSYS. In our case, we mostly use Abacus, but we also develop our own therm thermal history models. Why do we do that? Because the Abacus per se does not have the temperature fields that take into account the fluid flow. And in many cases, fluid flow is very important. So for that, we write a Python script, we run our in-house code, and then we supply Abacus with more detailed temperature field to get residual stress and distortion. And we have done so for different types of materials and different types of processes. So here for stainless steel 316, this is DDGMA gas metal arc, DD laser and powder bed fusion laser. And also we have done for different materials. We can also determine which variables are more important and which variables are less important by doing off-the-shelf uh, models. Uh, like in this case, we took a random forest model and we published it in 2020. So most important variable we found was the preheat temperature to control the residual stress and distortion. Professor William Sue's work I am showing, he is using an open source Navier-Stokes and energy equation solver called OpenFOAM, and his models are really excellent. So this is just a snapshot of how their model determines internal porosity in a very good resolution. That means it's powder scale model. And models for experienced researchers. Let me see if I can um, see if I can run a little simulation here. We can obtain the flow field. We can obtain temperature field. We can obtain cooling rates. We can obtain a lot of things that are generally not very easy to determine experimentally, like thermal cycles, right? near the fusion zone, but we can compute them and when we can make a measurement a little bit farther away from the interaction zone between the laser and materials, we can see that we can reliably predict the thermal cycles. Thermal cycles and temperature fields are also important to understand the shape of the fusion zone. They are not always hemispherical, as some people claim to be. Sometimes they are like W, sometimes they are like a bracket. So it depends on Prandtl number and Marangoni number. Prandtl number is the ratio of viscous diffusion rate to thermal diffusion rate. And Marangoni number is a measure of how strong the Marangoni flow or the surface tension gradient driven flow is taking place within the fusion zone. And the combination of those two determine the shape of the fusion zone. They also determine the effects of surface active elements like sulfur, selenium, tellurium, elements that has a large negative enthalpy of segregation. In simple terms, they like to go to the surface always. You know, there are many elements like that. Oxygen is one of those, nitrogen. And the difference you get in shape and size of the fusion zone is quite significant. The fusion zone circulation patterns change 
with a small amount of change in the concentration of those elements. And you can have a shallow and wide pool, or you can have a deep or narrow pool, depending on how much sulfur you have. And of course, we can predict the fusion zone geometry for the, the GMA, the, the laser, powder bed fusion laser. The scales are different. This is about eight millimeter width. Here, the width for the powder bed fusion is sub millimeter, 0.6 millimeter, as opposed to eight millimeter in the DGMA. So all these can be predicted before we do the experiments. So that's the benefit we get. And we can also predict simple features of microstructures, like I'm showing secondary dendrite arm spacings in stainless steel uh, as a function of laser power. If we use a higher power laser, then of course, we are going to get a bigger molten pool. It will cool slowly, so microstructure would be coarse. So like that, we can determine complex microstructures. We can determine uh, the morphology of the grains from the solidification growth rate and temperature gradient. And I am showing here three of Professor William Wei's papers, all in Actamet, to show under what conditions we will get columnar grains and under what conditions we will get equiax grains. And in some cases, in the middle, we will get equiax grains, but outside, we will get columnar grains. So we can also determine many features of microstructure and properties. My last slide, because my time is up, is about uh, the sum total of what I am saying. I presented results of data, models, and results of why modeling is critical to, for AM to progress, to make contributions in the area of solving scientific, technological, and economic problems of additive manufacturing. We can make material selection based on scientific principles. Also, future technologies like additive manufacturing, less empirical. You see, welding and casting, we could do a lot more experiments than we can with additive manufacturing because of the high costs of machines and high costs of the consumables. So, this would open up a completely new path for making progress in scientific understanding and solving technological problems. And everybody would be able to contribute, starting from beginner researchers, and your ideas would be the most important thing. You don't need specialized equipment. You don't need expensive laboratories. You don't need to be uh, in University Park. You can be in Abuja, Nigeria, or Bangalore, India, or University Park, or Nanjing. Your ideas will be the most important thing. So this would be a more inclusive world with modeling and experiments to make progress in additive manufacturing. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Deploy. Uh, uh, any question? Yeah. Hello, Professor Deploy. This is Hui Liang. <clears throat> this is Hui Liang Wei from Nanjing. I'm in the conference hall. So uh, thanks a lot for the wonderful presentation. I have a question here. Uh, so apparently we know that modeling and simulation are very, very important. But the thing is that we need to be uh, specific like if we want to do the simulation for Thai 64 for Inconel 718 or for some aluminum alloys, we need to know the thermophilic properties. But now people are doing things using multi-materials. So uh, sometimes we face the challenge of how to get the thermophilic properties and other properties to do the modeling. So can you please explain on that? Thanks. This is an excellent question. Thank you, Professor Wei. And this is why we need uh, more people to do modeling. 
and um, specifically the, the even a powder bed has a different thermophysical property than the solid metal right uh, for example the thermal conductivity of the powdered bed is much lower than the thermal conductivity of 100 percent dense material so we need models for thermophysical properties too and they are emerging specific, specifically for multi-materials. But even before we can go into the multi-materials, think of how many alloys can we additively manufacture very easily. Of the 5,500 commercial alloys, we can easily additively manufacture only a handful of alloys. That is why we need to synthesize both experiments and include modeling in our research program. Experiments are very valuable, but we also need modeling. Modeling will help us in ways that are much more important than for welding and casting. Okay. Yes. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Professor Bari. Okay. Thank so, you. Thank you. Any question? Thank you for your presentation, uh, Professor DeBroy. I have a question for you. At the present, the numerical model, models and the machine learning uh, are used in the digital or additive manufacturing. Could you please explain their important role in the digital twin? Thank you. The digital twins are dynamic models in the sense uh, every time we run a digital twin in action we also get data from the um, actual machine and the predictions improve with time whereas in a model the predictions are always the same am i making any sense thank you for your question because your question is very important uh, so there are differences, and that is why General Electric uses more than 5,500 digital twins, and so does NASA, and so does many other large corporations. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Professor Tiboloy, I have also a question. Please, sir. Uh, you, uh, I, I think your presentation is very frontier uh, for the modeling. My question is the, how to keep the precision of the modeling. This is, again, a very, very important issue. Thank you for raising this issue. Models have to be validated. And that is why I said at the beginning that I want to present data, models, and results to convince you that if you augment your project with both experiments and modeling, you will come out far ahead. So validation of the model and testing of the model are integral parts of uh, our culture. And this is a very critical point. Thank you for raising it. Okay, thank you very much. S thank you very much again. Okay.